All right, argument construction number three, our last argument construction for the course. And it's an argument construction that focuses exclusively on propositional logic. So no working on Venn diagrams, no talk of mood and figure. Uh, on this argument construction, we are going to be truth functions and truth tables and modus ponens all day long on this argument construction assignment. Now, what I want to do here is I want to go over the assignment and point out some things you want to make sure that you do and point to some mistakes that folks oftentimes make that you'll want to avoid so that you don't needlessly forfeit points that you should be collecting. So before we go any further, you need to make sure that you have a copy of this assignment in your hand so that you can take notes right on it about the things that you want to make sure you do and the things you want to avoid doing. And there's two ways that you can access a copy of this assignment prompt. One is by clicking the assignment button in Canvas and uh, going to argument construction number three. The other is to go to thought primer number 25. And you can scroll down here to part two and you'll see that there is a link to this assignment right there. And when you click that link, um, you're, it's going to take you to this page, and this is a super important page that I'm going to talk to you about here in a second. Um, what you need to do is click this link here. That'll give you a copy of the argument construction uh, assignment prompt, and when you have that in your hand, then you can come back from to the video and we'll move forward. But make sure you have a copy of that assignment prompt before you watch any more of this video. All right, so first note you want to make to yourself on your uh, assignment prompt is this page that's on your screen right now is the page you're going to submit your completed argument construction. You are not going to make the mistake of submitting your argument construction via the Thought Primer 25 assignment page. If you do that, I don't have the ability to score your argument construction and give you points for it because you'll see on the argument construction assignment page, is the scoring rubric that's used to score your argument construction. So make yourself a note. You are going to submit your argument construction number three via the assignment page for argument construction number three. All right. So a couple things to take note of. You want to make sure when you submit your argument construction assignment that you're submitting it on this form that you see on your screen right here. Okay. I don't want you to delete any of the text that's on this assignment prompt. Instead, what I want you to do is I want you to add in your answers in the spaces that are provided. Now, I don't care if you type your argument construction assignment or you handwrite it, but you want to make absolutely certain that however you do it, you do it in a manner that's easy for me to read. Don't leave me in the position where I'm trying to figure out whether or not one of your characters is a W or a tilde. You want to make sure that your truth values on your truth tables line up nicely underneath the propositions and letters that they're associated with and not submit some wonky truth table that's going sideways where I have to wonder what T's and F's are associated with what uh, propositions and what operators. So make sure that your argument construction assignment is really clear and easy for me to read so that I don't miss out on any of your awesome work. Now you'll see for the first couple of problems, you're going to be constructing arguments in response to questions that I pose to you. For the first argument, uh, you have an option or two options to choose from. I'm giving you uh, an, two options to choose from to create an argument. And the argument that you create for problem number one has to be a modus ponens. Okay. So for argument number one, you're going to construct an argument in response to a question. And the uh, response to that question is going to take the form of a modus ponens. Can't be a modus tollens. Can't be a hypothetical syllogism. Um, it's modus ponens. And once you've got that argument written out in ordinary language, like with real words, like the ones you're hearing me speak right now, you get to move on to question number two. And question number two asks you to construct an ordinary language, I'm sorry, an ordinary truth table. Okay, that means you're going to use L equals two to the N. Do not make the mistake that I see folks make in constructing an indirect truth table here. You need an ordinary truth table. So maybe highlight that on your prompt. You want an ordinary truth table. After you construct your ordinary truth table, examine it to make sure there's no line on which the conclusion is false and all of the premises are true. Because if such a line exists, that's a sign you didn't create a modus ponens for question number one, because modus ponens is a valid argument. So use your truth table to verify the work you did for question number one. Also, don't make the mistake of failing to include the sentences that each letter of your symbolized modus ponens in question number two represents. Okay, You want to make sure that you indicate that this letter represents this sentence, and you want to make sure you include every single word of that sentence. Don't just include a couple of words. We want to see a, a complete sentence next to the letter that is representing that sentence. All right. 
Then you get to move on to question number three, and question number three is an area where folks frequently make a very needless mistake. Question number three is asking you to justify the soundness of the argument that you created in problem number one, or in step one. What that means is this. You want to take each one of your premise statements. There will be two. You're going to take each one of those, and you are going to provide reasons for believing that those two statements are true. Okay? Don't make the mistake of explaining why you think the conclusion is true. That's a fatal error. Okay? You want to justify the soundness of the argument by giving us reasons to believe that both of those premise statements are true. And a really effective strategy that I see people using to make sure they avoid justifying the conclusion is they just present each premise numbered. Here's my first premise, number one. Here's my second premise, number two. And here's why I think premise number one is a true statement. Don't make the mistake of saying that you think it's a true statement because of your experience or because of what you think. Instead, think about how you would provide reasons or evidence or source material that would convince anyone that there's good reason for believing that that premise statement is true. Don't just offer one or two sentences. Really flesh out your ideas so that we can see what the justification is that you have for believing that those two premise statements are true. And we don't expect you to prove that those statements are true definitively, right? We just expect you to make a good case for them. And the better the case you make, the better you're going to score on this. All right, then you get to move on to question number four. And question number four asks you this. To which premise of the argument is someone most likely to object? And what are likely to be the objections to this premise? So you know that someone's going to look at your argument and they're going to look at one or more of those premises and they're going to say, I have doubts about that one. I'm skeptical of that. I don't, I'm not convinced that's a true statement. And in question number four, you want to give some indication of what you think those doubts might be. What might be the reasons that someone would offer for doubting one or both of your premises? And you really want to give an indication here in number four that you have given consideration to your audience and what their thinking might be. And again, not just one sentence. You don't want to do something like, I think somebody would object to premise number two. It's like, all right. Well, how would they object to it? Flesh out their answer. Make the best case against your own premise that you can. That's how you get in a really good position to be able to respond to those objections. Once you've done that, you're done with the first uh, argument. And there's only five on this assignment. So then you get to move on to the next one, which is very similar to problem number one in that it's asking you to answer a question, except now you're being asked to answer the questions with in the form of a modus tollens argument, not modus ponens. Okay? So you'll answer your question, you'll come up with a good modus tollens argument, and then you're going to construct for number two your indirect truth table, not an ordinary one. So make note, for argument number two, question two, you're being asked to construct an indirect truth table. And again, make sure it's clear what sentences each letter of your indirect truth table makes sense or is representing. Um, make sure you include every word from each one of those sentences. Um, and make sure that you give some indication of where in your indirect truth table you've run into a contradiction. Where have you run into a place in your indirect truth table that actually proves your argument valid? And remember, if you're able to complete all of the truth values for all of the propositions and operators for your indirect truth table without creating a contradiction, that means your argument's invalid. And you want to go back and look at that thing uh, look at that modus tollens that you created for question number one and revise it so that it turns out to be a valid argument. Because remember, in a valid argument with an indirect truth table, you're not going to be able to deduce all the truth values without coming across a contradiction. And then you can see for argument number two, question number three and four, they're the same as the questions in argument number one. Why do you think your premises are true and why might somebody object to them? Then you get to move on to argument number three, which again asks you a question, but now you have options. You can respond to this question with a modus ponens, a modus tollens, or a pure hypothetical syllogism. Okay, so you pick the form of argument that you want to uh, create as a response to this question. You just want to make sure you respond to the question. And you want to make sure for all of your arguments that your conclusion is a direct response to the question. And then your premises are the reasons that justify your response to the question. And you'll see here in argument number three, I'm asking you which form of argument did you choose? Modus potens, modus tollens, hypothetical. Uh, and then again, you're being asked to create an indirect truth table. And again, if when you create that indirect truth table, you're able to deduce all the values of the propositions and operators without creating a contradiction, your argument is invalid and you want to go back and fix that argument in uh, question number one. And then again, you can see here, 
questions four and five uh, are asking you to do the same thing. Justify the soundness of the argument by explaining why you think your premise statements are true and anticipate the objections that people might offer to those premises. Then we get to argument number four, where you have a number of topics that you can choose from. And here you can create any type of argument that addresses any one of these topics or some topic other than these topics of your choosing. And you can use a modus ponens, a modus tollens, a disjunctive syllogism, hypothetical syllogism, any of those to create an argument that deals with some aspect of, of the issues that you see on the screen in front of you or some other topic of your choosing. And you'll see that the questions here are very similar to the questions that uh, you were answering for the other problems, with this exception. Question number three asks you, what is the question your argument addresses? Okay, so here you're going to be writing a question. And the question that you write should be the question that would lead to the conclusion of the argument that you've offered us, okay? Because your argument is addressing a question and it addresses the question in the conclusion. So what's the question that your conclusion purports to answer? And that's what you want to include for argument or uh, number three here. Now you'll go through here, you'll see it's a lot of the same kinds of things that you were doing with the previous arguments. And then you get to move on to the very last argument, which is a very different kind of question. Because argument number five, number one is asking you to create an invalid argument. I want you to create an invalid argument here. You have to create an invalid ordinary language argument, in other words an argument that uses words just like the ones you're listening to me speak right now, an invalid ordinary language argument that answers this question. Is logic class the most superific class ever? ever? You'll come up with your argument, it will be invalid, and then for question number two, you're going to create an ordinary truth table that shows us that that argument is invalid. If there's no line on this ordinary truth table that shows a conclusion to the conclusion to be false when all of the premises are also true on that line, you didn't create an invalid argument and you want to go back and revisit your previous answer. Okay, so you're going to construct an ordinary truth table, L equals 2 to the N, not an indirect truth table, another common mistake that folks make here. You want to make sure that each of the letters that you're using in your truth table is clearly connected to the complete sentence that makes up your ordinary language argument. And then you're going to move forward to the last couple of questions here, which ask you to take that argument that you originally offered that's invalid and revise it into a valid argument and then present that and prove it, it's valid with an indirect truth table. So again, Make note of this indirect truth table for the final question on argument number five, not an ordinary language argument. All right. So that's the assignment. When you've done, when you've completed that, you're all done and you're on your way to finishing out the course successfully.